Greetings and welcome in the name of the one who creates us and loves us as we are, but who loves us enough not to leave us where we are. Come, be welcome in the embrace of worship this day. My name is Bart Hildreth. I'm the senior pastor here at First St. Charles. In a little while, I'll be sharing a message pulled straight from our church's history entitled, When the Ugly Man Speaks. It's a message of hope for us all. We do want to welcome all who are with us for worship, but especially those of our guests or first-time worshipers. It is our deep prayer that our worship would connect you more closely with God and with our community of faith. If you're worshiping online, we would ask that you take a moment to let us know that you're worshiping with us by filling out our Connect card on our website at firststcharlesumc.org. We would also invite you to have before you some bread and some fruit of the vine in anticipation of Holy Communion later in the service. Now, before we continue in worship, I do want to let you know about something special happening on Sunday, October 3rd. Our bishop, Bob Farr, will be with us to preach as a part of our bicentennial celebration at both in-person worship services at 9 and 11 o'clock. And then following the 11 o'clock service, there will be an all-church dinner here at the church. You don't have to bring a thing, just yourselves. Now, as we all worship together, will you bring your very best as we join in our call to worship? Let your hearts be open to the Lord today. We bring our hearts to God. Let your hearts be glad and your spirits rejoice. We give thanks to God who offers us new life. Let us worship God with gratitude and praise.
Church, and I am blessed to serve as one of the associate pastors. This week, we'll be praying a prayer adapted from the website and resource in Flesh. So, friends, will you pray with me, please? O oh God, in your image, you created everything and called it good. An abundant diversity or likeness is found in us. We reject all messages that belittle or degrade any among us. Because you created us, our bodies of every size, age, and ability have dignity and are sacred. You bless our complexions of every shade. You bless our orientations and genders, drawing us toward love of you, love of neighbor, and even love of enemy. We praise you, God, our creator, who blesses us with this world, these bodies, and our fellow creatures who are so very good. God of holy chaos, you don't protect us from getting swept up into the relationships and systems and experiences that are messy. But you do promise us that you will be found in the midst of them. Help us remember that when the world is aching, when we were aching, that you draw near and you put on flesh. It was through that enfleshed reality of love that you transformed our world. We realize that relationship with you is not an escape. It is the hope and courage we need to dive right into the mess of things. You, O oh God, are enfleshed in our beautiful but aching earth. In our work for a just society and in our efforts to love and be loved. We pray that as a church, we may gather new people to Christ, grow in Christ, and go in Christ so that all may know that with you, they are safe, welcome, and wanted. May our prayer life and our life as disciples be invitations into that life with you. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, my name is Keith Jantz and I have the honor of serving as the senior adult pastor. You know, one of the things that's been amazing over this past year of this time during the pandemic has been your generous support of those services in our community that reach out and help those in need. Now, one of those services that we do support is FISH, and we received a note from them just the other day that I want to share with you. It says, members of First United, as always, we are so grateful for your unfailing support. Without your gifts, we would cease to exist. During these trying COVID times, our new normal seems to be organized chaos. Plans are made, then changed. New procedures are put in place, then altered. But throughout it all, we have always been there for those in need. A referral is the only requirement then they can be obtained from a local church or for, uh, from coordinated entry. We thank you for your amazing donation of 3,037 items during this past months, six months. May God shower you with blessings, the folks at FISH. 3,037 items. That's amazing. And you helped many, many people through your support of, of FISH. Now, there are many services that reach out and help those in our community, many ministries in our church that do the same thing. And those are all made possible by your generosity. 
There are five ways in which you can give to the church. You can either mail a check in. You can go online to our website and give that way. You can use the, our app on your phone. You can text your offering in. Or better yet, you can join us for worship at 9 and 11 on Sunday morning and place your offering in a plate. No matter how you give, we appreciate your support. Now let us listen to some special music. And may God touch your heart in a special way. join me as we pray over our gifts. Take what we have, O oh God, and use it for your work. Take our gifts to fund ministry and mission. Take our hearts that our love for others might become more real. Take our hands that we might do things that make a real difference in our world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. from 1 Samuel chapter 16. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
true story. It was Saturday and the county newspaper, hot off the press, announced, and I quote, the ugly man will preach at the church tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. The ugly man, the ugly man, the ugly man is coming. Make way for the ugly man. Who's your pastor? The ugly man. I was in the hospital and the ugly man came by to see me. Sweetheart, the ugly man called and invited us to be a part of a Bible study. That's Reverend Dr. Ugly Man to you. We might even imagine some ugly pastor jokes. My pastor was so ugly. How ugly was he? He was so ugly, the conference paid us to take him. In a world obsessed with beauty, even people of faith are not immune. Today, we're going deeper because the ugly truth is we often don't. But let's first acknowledge that there are some good reasons we start on the surface. For starters, it's the first thing we learn about someone. Their appearance. Are they tall? Or are they short? Are they just right? Are they overweight? Are they underweight? Are they just right? Are they young? Are they old? Are they just that right age? What color is their hair? How do they dress? The appearance of another is often the first thing we learn about another. We can even imagine some biological evolutionary reasons that people operate in us beyond our self-consciousness, driving us to an attraction to certain persons over another. What's more, God has made us a bodied self. That's the second thing. Right off the bat, Christianity encountered the temptation to separate body and soul, matter and spirit. Loudly and clearly, Christianity said, Orthodox Christianity said, no, and declared it a heresy to suggest otherwise. Still, Christians couldn't help themselves suggesting ways that human sexuality might be a sin, or at least relegating it to procreation, asserting a greater intrinsic value to lighter skin over darker skin, or claiming a hierarchy that privileged male bodies over that of females. Many are the ways that we have denied our bodied selves and so castigated the very creation of God. It was the 20th century Jewish philosopher Martin Buber who drew out the important distinction between what he called I-it relationships, the relationships that we have with things, and what he called an I-thou relationship that we have with persons. And ultimately, the I-thou relationship we have with God. The problems come, the idolatry comes, he said, when we turn an I-thou relationship into an I-it relationship, treating human beings as an object to be used, manipulated, discarded, devalued. The human body is a creation of God Almighty to be celebrated, not condemned. There is no body God doesn't love. There is no body God doesn't love. As the poet Gerhard Manley Hopkins put it, Glory be to God for dappled things. Which is another way of saying, if you got freckles, praise them. But, and here's the tricky part, the part we sometimes don't get past. Our bodied selves matter, 
but not ultimately. Here's the setting for today's text. God has appointed Samuel to pick a successor to King Saul. Samuel the prophet, Samuel the priest, Samuel the kingmaker goes to the home of Jesse in the little backwater town of Bethlehem to pick and anoint a king, one of Jesse's sons. Okay, seems simpler than having an electronic electoral college do it. Except... Jesse had a whole bunch of sons. Start with the eldest, the one who had probably already had military experience. His name was Eliab. Eliab was brought before him. Surely, Samuel thought, the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? Is that all you got? Well, said Jesse, Now that I think about it, uh, there is one more. What's his name? David. Oh yes, David, the runt of the litter. I forget about him. He's out in the field. Get him. He did. And he was the one. Our bodied selves matter, but not ultimately this last year, didn't we get uh, a great teacher for this in the person of the great Simone Biles? She showed herself to become even greater when despite all the pressures to compete and all the temptations to give in, she withdrew from competition, aware enough of her bodied self to know that she was caught in What we learned is called the twisties. When gymnasts compete, they often fly through the air in death-defying flips and tumbles and turns, flipping on one axis while twisting on another. It all happens so fast, there's little time to adjust. You rely on muscle memory, trusting that it will work out because with so much practice, It usually does. But there's a phenomenon we've learned where gymnasts lose track of where their body is moving in the midst of these twists and turns. Your brain feels disconnected from your body. Your limbs that usually control how much spin you have have stopped listening. And you feel lost. This can lead to injury, and often great tragedy. I had no idea where I was in the air, Biles said. I could have hurt myself. Ms. Biles, who often performs some of the world's hardest skills, a double-twisting, double-tuck dismount off the beam, and a triple-twisting, double-tuck off the floor, was self-aware enough, spiritually healthy enough, in touch with her body and mind, to know that she wasn't able to do what she would have needed to do. In the process, she gave us something more than any Olympian for whom to be proud. She gave us an example 
of courage and strength, she showed the world a person who wasn't an I-it thing on display, but an I-thou person whose value far exceeds any gold medal ever given. If I can twist midair in my message, I would point you to Thomas Merton. Merton was arguably the 20th century's greatest monk and mystic. And that's not something you hear much. And so I was pleasantly surprised when one of our church members asked me about him and even started reading him. Merton says in one of his great poems, there is in all visible things a hidden wholeness. There is in all things an inexhaustible sweetness and purity, a silence that is a fount of action and joy. It rises up in wordless gentleness and flows out to me from the unseen roots of all created being, welcoming me tenderly, saluting me with indescribable humility. There is a hidden wholeness. This wholeness is the good news for this day. Here's why. You may be young. You won't always be. You may be good looking. It may not last. You may be healthy and your body in great shape. However, as one writer points out, a greater than 50% chance exists that an individual who is currently able-bodied will be physically disabled, either temporarily or permanently. This is the good news. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. We would do well to do so too. Glory, glory, glory to God for dappled things. And that ugly man, the one appointed to preach at that church, it was this church. The year was 1852. The preacher's name was Enoch Mather Marvin. He would go on to become a representative for St. Charles Methodist College and a bishop in the Methodist church. Thanks to the newspaper, the pews were absolutely packed for his first Sunday. Thanks to the gospel, quite a number of them stuck around. In that spirit, feel free to tell all your friends that next Sunday here at this church, that ugly man is scheduled to preach. I am Debbie Bartley, honored to serve as one of First St. Charles Associate Pastors. That was a challenging message. Challenging to hear as I realized how I have made unfair judgments based upon a person's appearance. Challenging as I know what I need to do. And perhaps you were challenged by the message too. Have there been times when you too have failed to look at a person's heart and made a judgment solely on their appearance like I have done? With God's help, we can do better. So the question I am going to be asking myself, and I invite you to ask yourself too, is this. How will you look past someone's appearance and see them as God sees them, as a beloved child of God? How will you see everyone as God sees them? And now, as you are able, will you stand for benediction? 
my sisters, brothers, and friends in Christ, look at our bodied self. Delight in God's creation of you and others, those like you and those not like you. But then look deeper. See as God sees. For God doesn't do ugly. This is the truly beautiful truth. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen.